Okay, everybody, so let's get ready to take a look at calculating degrees of unsaturation. So this should always be the first step in your walking through a problem where you potentially have a molecular formula. So if you don't have the molecular formula, you can skip this step. However, if you are given any type of molecular formula, this should be your first stop. It should not take you very long, but it is worth doing because it's going to set up parameters when you're getting ready to move on to things like your NMR. And what do I mean by parameters? This tells you how many double bonds, triple bonds, ring structures, anything that would constitute a degree of unsaturation, which we'll talk about, this is going to set up those parameters. So let's say you only have one degree of unsaturation and a benzene ring requires four degrees of unsaturation. If you get to your NMR and you only have one degree of unsaturation and you think your NMR is telling you that you have an aromatic ring, you can be sure that that's incorrect. You either calculated the degrees of unsaturation wrong or you're not reading the NMR correct. So what we're going to do here is take a look at how we calculate degrees of unsaturation and what degrees of unsaturation is going to lead to. All right, so here's the formula. Degrees of unsaturation, which will be abbreviated very often DOU, is calculated by two times the number of carbons in the formula, plus two, plus the nitrogens, minus any halides, minus the hydrogens present, divided by two. That is your formula. All right, now let's talk about the reasoning for this formula, the, the way that it exists and why it exists. So when we get ready to look at this, two carbons, okay, or two times carbon, is going to be based on two hydrogens per an internal carbon. So what this means is when I am looking at a carbon chain, right, if I create a carbon chain like this, every internal carbon when the compound is saturated is going to be a CH2, meaning it has two hydrogens per carbon. So that's where the 2C comes from. The 2 is because we have two hydrogens per every carbon. So we just multiply the number of carbons times two. All right. Now, when we get to the terminal positions, these are CH3s, not CH2s. So I have two terminal ends to a chain, CH3 and CH3. So I need to account for, since these aren't CH2s, there's an additional hydrogen here, and there's an additional hydrogen here. That means I need a plus two right here. That's where the plus two is coming from. So this plus two is due to the fact that the terminal carbons need to have an additional hydrogen for each one. All right, so now we're up to if we just had carbons. Now what happens if we add these additional what's called heteroatoms? So nitrogen, the halogens, the oxygens. Well, for nitrogen, you would add a hydrogen. So think about what's gonna happen if there's a nitrogen present in a chain structure like this. So all of a sudden I throw a nitrogen in and then I keep going, right? When this nitrogen disrupts, if it doesn't have any hydrogen associated with it, we could technically ignore it. However, in order to complete this, we would have one hydrogen, right? So when nitrogen disrupts, we normally are going to replace it with a hydrogen. So we add one hydrogen when it disrupts a carbon-carbon bond like this. And you can go through and you can test different examples where you're looking at this, and you'll find that every time a nitrogen is present, you would need to add one hydrogen to the formula, even if it's terminal or examples like that. So that means we do plus N for the number of nitrogens. Now think about what happens if I have a halide. If I had a bromine coming directly off of this carbon, Right? then that means that this carbon right here would look like the following. It would be a C with an H, and instead of being CH2, the bromine replaces a hydrogen. So if I have a halide, it means I'm going to have one less hydrogen on that chain. And when I get ready to look at that, that means that when I have the minus X here, right, I'm going to remove one of the hydrogens from the carbon chain. So that's why I have minus X for every halide that's present. Now if I have an oxygen, think about what it would look like with an ether. Similar to what I was just talking about with the nitrogen example, an oxygen can be ignored. Because when an oxygen is present, 
it does not really cause any disruption in the number of hydrogens that would be expected. So we can ignore any oxygens when we're calculating the degrees of unsaturation. Now the hydrogens, because we've been revolving all of this around hydrogens, when you deal with the hydrogens, you're going to remove the actual number of hydrogens in your formula from the theoretical number that could be contained. So when we look at this, this value right here is going to be if the compound were totally saturated. That's what it's giving us. So this is the number of hydrogens that could be present if we had a saturated compound. This is a theoretical value minus the number of actual hydrogens. Okay, so when you take the difference between those two, that's going to lead to the number of hydrogens that would be missing if the compound is to be saturated. And then you divide that by two to get a degree of unsaturation. So you divide by two because it takes two hydrogens to be removed in order to cre create a degree of unsaturation. So what does that mean? Well, a degree of unsaturation can lead to a couple of things. It can be a double bond, that would be one degree of unsaturation, a triple bond, which would be two degrees of unsaturation, or a ring, which would be one degree of unsaturation. So let's take a look, for instance, at a ring example. If I had a five-membered ring, every single point in the ring is going to have two hydrogens. They would all be CH2s. So what's going on here is, remember, if I had a terminal grouping, it would have two CH3s. Because the ring takes that terminal end and it seals it up into a cyclic form, it has to remove two hydrogens in order to accomplish that. I can't have a CH3 stuck in the ring. That would violate the uh, carbon only having four bonds. So when I take a look at this structure here, I had to remove two hydrogens in order to create the ring, and that's going to be one degree of unsaturation. So a ring, no matter what the ring looks like, it could even be a three-membered ring, it could be a benzene ring, the ring will count for one degree of unsaturation. Now the same thing is true of a double bond. So imagine that I have a CH3, CH2, CH2, right? If I have a butane, for a simple example, and I want to create a double bond in the middle here, in order to create an alkene, I have to remove two hydrogens, right? It becomes a CH double bonded to a CH and then a CH3. So I had to remove a hydrogen from each. Removing two hydrogens is again going to be one degree of unsaturation. So if I did a triple bond, I would have to do that twice, right? Because it would be a carbon and a carbon. I'd have to remove those two additional hydrogens. So in that case, I'm going to end up with two degrees of unsaturation for a triple bond. Now, let's say that I calculate four degrees of unsaturation. Does that mean I know what the structure is or what they're leading to? No, not necessarily, because I could have all sorts of different combos with four degrees of unsaturation. I could have two triple bonds. I could have four fused rings. I could have four double bonds. I could have a triple bond and two rings. I could have two double bonds and two rings. You can see that as the degrees of unsaturation increase, I'm going to have more and more options available. Whereas if I had just one degree of unsaturation, I either have a double bond or I have a ring. Those are the only two choices. If I have two degrees of unsaturation, I could have two rings. I could have a double bond and a ring. I could have two double bonds or I could have one triple bond. So as we continue to build up in degrees of unsaturation, we build up in the number of potential compounds. So it's good to do the math on this and get it out of the way because when you start proposing the structure, which you should not be doing here, but when you propose the structure based on your NMRs and your IRs, you'll be able to come back up and check yourself. So if you create a structure and it's got three double bonds, you know you need three degrees of unsaturation. If you have more than that, you should be proposing additional degrees of unsaturation in your structure. And if you have less than that, then you need to consider where you could remove some of them. So this is a very good first check that you set up for yourself. All right, so here are some examples, and we're going to run through these. 
and determine the degrees of unsaturation in each case by executing the formula. So the first one, it's two times the number of C's. So this is how we're gonna operate. It's two, right, times three. And then it's always plus two because of that terminal part. And then it's plus any nitrogens, none present. I can ignore the oxygens. And then the halides, I need to subtract per halide. So there's one halide here. And then all of that is going to be minus the number of actual hydrogens present, which is five divided by two. So it would be six plus two, right, which is eight, minus one, which is seven, minus five, which is two. So two divided by two is equal to one degree of unsaturation. And that's all you need to do. That's about how long it should take you. This should be a 30 second exercise when you're dealing with these um, compounds. And then it's on to the next thing so that you can start analyzing and proposing a structure. All right, so what I would encourage you to do is pause the lecture at this point and see if you can work through the rest of these and then unpause it when you're ready. It shouldn't take you very long. So what I'll do is I'll start working through the rest of these. Hopefully you've had a chance to practice them or you can follow along if you don't feel ready. So this would be two times five. Now this is a bit of a simple one, plus two minus 10. Divided by two is once again going to be one degree of unsaturation. The next one here, we have two times six, plus two minus two, because of the halide, minus four divided by two. This is going to be four degrees of unsaturation. Now these last two, these are some larger examples here, but they shouldn't be too intimidating because this is still just basic arithmetic. All right, the first structure here is cholesterol, and the second one is bilirubin. So for anybody who is doing med school or MCAT stuff, you should be somewhat familiar with those terms. All right, 27 times two plus two. Remember, oxygens are ignored, so minus 46 divided by two is going to be five degrees of unsaturation. Right. And then for the bilirubin, 33 times 2 plus 2. Now remember, the nitrogens are added. So plus 4 minus 36 divided by 2 is going to be 18 degrees of unsaturation. If you don't believe me, go look up the structure of bilirubin and count the number of double bonds and cyclical structures you find there. It's a bit overwhelming when you look at it, but it is 18 degrees of unsaturation. So this is how you calculate degrees of unsaturation. This should be your first stop on your path to solving any type of unknown organic structure using spectra. So that concludes this lecture. And I will see everybody over in the next lecture series, which is going to start looking at mass spectrum and how we can get some useful information from that quickly and then move on to the IR and then eventually the NMRs. And the way this is moving along, we should be spending more and more time on each subsequent thing. So the mass spec, you should be spending a little bit more time than the degrees of unsaturation, the IR more than the mass spec. And then the NMRs are, again, where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. So I will see everybody in the next lecture, and thanks for tuning in.